just one point that I really want to tie up. I felt it was a little bit messy uh, at the end yesterday. Just one point I really want to tie up just so you are with me on this. Just um, open your Bibles, please, brothers and sisters, to Genesis chapter 34. <coughs> In Genesis chapter 34, as we said, it was obviously in the context of Dinah. I just want to just leave a little thought with you, and then you can take this and go and study it for yourselves. Quite beautiful. I, I came across this. It was in the early hours of the morning. Uh, I, I was about to wake Alison, but somehow I don't think she would have appreciated it. Uh, Genesis chapter 34, please, and verse 2. Remember, in the chapter, we have Jew and Gentile, right? Are you with me? Verse 2. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite. So they're Hivites, all right? Now, some of you might be with me already. This is exquisite, brothers and sisters. It really is in this chapter, we're told that this man, Shechem, was more honourable than all his brethren. And the question that we must ask ourselves is simply this. Who is more honourable in this chapter? The line of Jacob? Or the line of the Gentile? They make preparation to be circumcised and come into the line and through treachery and this is Jacob's take on it in Genesis chapter 49 so we know it and we know it's right and we know that we are allowing scripture to interpret scripture for us that they are instruments of cruelty and they are condemned for their treachery for their murder for not allowing this Hivite and their household to come in. Are you with me? Please keep that in mind, brothers and sisters, and come with me to Joshua chapter 9. And those of you who are discerning, you will see, ever before we hit chapter 9, where I'm taking you. J Joshua chapter, uh, chapter 9. So the Gentiles... The high vites, they weren't allowed to come in, right? Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. These people who would be against you, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, right? Verse 7. The men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure, turn ye, uh, ye dwell among us, and how shall we... Make a league with you. You know the story. The Gibeonites are Hivites. It's told us there in verse 17. The Hittites had the city of Gibeon, Chephra, Beeroth, Kirjath, Jerim. Brothers and sisters, you are with me on this, I take it. The first time the Hivites wanted to come in as Gentiles, they were dealt with out of hand. The second time, they deal wilily, the verse says, remember, to prove that they had come from a long way. Shoes on their feet, old shoes clouted upon their, their feet. Moldy bread. You see these wine bottles? When we left home, there were Soft and pliable. Now look at them. Stiff as a board. You see these shoes? They were brand new when we left home. Now they're old and clouted upon our feet. You see this bread? It was fresh when we, it came out of our ovens. Now it's blue and moldy and green. <coughs> we come from a far country. Come in. Welcome. What a thing, brothers and sisters. They made it. You know, it almost brings tears to your eyes. They made it. 
I could show you that the Gibeonites were the Nethanim. I could take you a reference to take you, in fact, so you know that it is there. 2 Samuel chapter 21, please. Uh, I hope the clock hasn't st started yet. <laughs> 2 Samuel chapter 21, please. I I've got to show you this, brethren and sisters. I find this so exciting. 2 Samuel chapter 21. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. So where was that account? Come on, where was it? The Gibeonites, brethren and sisters, wherever you find a priest, you'd find a Gibeonite. Faithful people. We come full circle. The, the Gibeonites are now being brought into Bethel, the house of the Lord. Let's prove that. You will have it in your margin, 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 18 and 19. In the, in the context of David and Saul and Doeg the Edomite. The Gibeonites, brethren and sisters, they were the ones who were sworn to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. Where? In the house of God. What a strange paradox that is, brothers and sisters. Are you with me with this? Not only was Jacob found at Bethel, why the Gentiles were found at Bethel also. And they became a faithful line. And who were the faithless? Why it was Jacob's sons themselves. There it is in verse 19. And Nob the city of the priests smote he with the edge of the swords. Both men and women, children and suckling, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Oh yes, brothers and sisters, where you found the priests, you would find the Nethanim. They were put to one side in the days of Jacob. And that same people who were dealt with out of hand were brought in to work and labor and serve God. And therefore, when the scripture says that thou mayest knowest how to behave thyself in the house of God, we could talk about Rahab the harlot. And there she is there unto this day. Start the clock, please. Genesis, please, brothers and sisters. Chapter 35. So he continues to Bethel. And we're told, brothers and sisters, that in verse, uh, verse 16 and 17, 18, Rachel dies in childbirth. And then we're told in verse 21 that a pillar and Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And just as an aside, it tells you, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhar, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. So what do you think about that, brothers and sisters? Do you think he's just saying that just in passing? Someone's going to ask me for chapter and verse afterwards. I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. But I have my strong suspicions. Notice the context carefully, please. Rachel had now died. And in so 
through her death. Reuben, Bram sisters, being the firstborn. If we had time, we could look at 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, to see how Reuben was displaced. He was the firstborn. And is there some sort of jockeying for position here? Bilhah was the handmaid of Rachel, remember? Therefore, possibly, brethren and sisters, Reuben takes her and lays with her. In some way, perhaps, jockeying once more for supremacy to get back into that firstborn line. Perhaps. We know that Absalom did the very similar thing, did he not? With the concubines of David? To show that he was the one who would take the throne. To show that he was superior. Perhaps. Perhaps. And then notice in the context of Genesis how it, it ends with chapter 35, he goes back to Bethel, did you notice? He's almost come full circle. And then chapter 36, it begins again with the genealogies of who? Esau. And the whole chapter begins again. It's almost like a reoccurrence of Esau, his dukes, his, the Edomites, Mount Seir. And the whole chapter is taken over with the genealogies of Esau, notice. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Let's just feel the context in our final talk. <coughs> his brother threatened to kill him. So he fled for his life. He was treated as a slave in the home of his uncle for 20 years. He was tricked into marrying a woman that he never loved. His two sons were mass murderers. His wife died in childbirth. The wife he loved, the only wife he really ever loved. His daughter was, no, his only daughter was sexually seduced by an uncircumcised man. His eldest son committed incest. The son he loved disappeared without a trace. Presumed dead for over 20 long, lonely years. He walked with a physical disability. Brothers and sisters, family life in the Lord is not an easy life in the Lord. And I dare say that with all those things that Jacob experienced throughout his life can be found within the household of faith. We are not exempt from any of those things, brothers and sisters. <coughs> not one of us. And it's things like that which teach us and remind us that it's nice to be on the spiritual heights when everything is nice and rosy in our lives, when there are no challenges. It's nice to be on the spiritual heights, the spiritual mountaintops, but inevitably so, brothers and sisters, the rich growth is always in the valleys. Yea, though I walk the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall, finish it, dwell in the house of the Lord. Bethel, forever. Notice what it says. We won't look at it now. Jacob, arise. Go to Bethel and dwell there. That is the point. It's not just going to Bethel, brothers and sisters, is it? It's dwelling there. It's wanting to be there. It's being comfortable there. It's being familiar in the true sense of the word and the things of God. And so we move on through the pages, chapter 37. And it focuses back again on Jacob. And then we focus back on verse 3. And we're coming full circle. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. It's rather like, it's a Bible echo, isn't it? Somebody once said, uh, we used to call it Bible references in uh, years ago. It's an echo. It's And Isaac loved Esau. And Rebecca loved Jacob. And there was an extreme. And extremes begat extremes. There was a division of loyalties which led to deception and, in, and so on and so forth. And intrigue. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors or coat of many pieces. The priestly garment. If we had time, we could see or suggest that when Rebecca says to Jacob to put on he gets goodly garment that belonged to Esau. Do you think it might have been the, uh, the priestly garments, perhaps? It just says goodly, goodly garments. You look at it for yourself. So there he is, possibly, in the, high, in the family high priest garment that Esau had in his wardrobe. And he presents himself for the blessing. Just a suggestion. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. That's the challenge in family life, isn't it, brothers and sisters? To get the balance, to be equal, to show have that equilibrium in, in, in the family life. And so, this idea then of separation and, and division. He loved Joseph. And then towards the end of chapter, in chapter 37, of course there is the deception and how he's taken away. But we're really focusing on Jacob. And he knew, verse 33, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. And there again the echo of how all those years earlier, a kid was killed and the skin was put on. The deception again, brothers and sisters, coming back. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Verse 35. Thus his father wept for him. Have you ever thought in your life, Brem sisters, that it couldn't get much worse? And then all of a sudden, something else just comes upon us. And we don't understand. We're not sure why. What is God trying to teach us? What is God trying to tell us? What lessons must I learn? 
It was a searching time for Jacob, brothers and sisters. A man who in his formative years was quite happy and quite content to work things out in his life, in his own strength, in his own intellect, in his own way. And now as the years roll by, there are things which now increasingly so are totally out of his control. He's left hopeless and helpless. And his faith is tried and tested in ways which we cannot imagine. And he wept for him. And then all of a sudden, chapter 38 changes and there is a juxtaposition between chapter 37 of Joseph and chapter 38 of Judah. And what the chapters are inviting us to do, brothers and sisters, is to make that comparison between Joseph in Egypt and Judah in all his waywardness. For there are stories within stories, lessons within lessons in the life of Jacob and in his sons. How they had to learn. How they had to bear. How they had to learn to trust in God. And learn sobering lessons about themselves. As Judah did. And then chapter 39 switches back again to Joseph in Egypt. Chapter 39, chapter 40, chapter 41 is all about Joseph in Egypt. And those verses are more actually silent about Joseph and those difficult years, those years of loneliness, those years of being fe fe felt bereft of his son that he loved dearly. So what was the point of God taking him through that? Was it necessary for God to take this man into another realm, another dimension of agony and hardship and torment. He didn't even have Joseph to look into his young tender eyes and see the wife, the only wife he really ever wanted. Chapter 42. We could have added to the list that he had a son that was incarcerated in a different land, actually, even Simeon. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why, brethren and sisters, why does Joseph choose out Simeon? Well, we know that Reuben, being the firstborn, we know that he was, you know, rather... He was panicking about the situation and he, 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 he goes off the scene, doesn't he? And he comes back and the pit is empty. He said, Let, let's not kill him. Put him in a pit. And then he hightails out of there, right? Unstable of, as water. That's what Jacob says of him in chapter 49. So why Simeon? Was it not that Simeon being the second birth should have backed his brother up? Well, we know he was an instrument of cruelty. And it is Judah. Notice again. Who says, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. And that's the sharp contrast that I think the chapters are trying to remind us, brothers and sisters. <coughs> verse 1, uh, uh, verse 2 of, of, of Genesis chapter 42. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence 
that we may live and not die. And as you read the verses, you put them together, you get the distinct impression that literally, literally, it was a very much hand-to-mouth thing. So maybe we can add that to something which is maybe out of certainly all of our experiences here in this land of plenty that we live with much more besides. And so they go down, brothers and sisters, into Egypt and they meet Joseph. We know the record well. And then when they come back, the brethren tell Jacob that this man spoke roughly to us and he says, don't come back unless you bring your youngest brother. Verse 36, and Jacob their father said unto them, me have ye bereaved of my, now children is in italics, of my Joseph. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Do we feel that sometimes, brothers and sisters, that things are against us in every way, shape or form? Now look what Reuben says. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not the, to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And here, possibly, brothers and sisters, maybe comes out some sort of, you know, cynicism. He's skeptical, maybe, about, about Reuben. And he said, My son shall not go down with you. How good were they at hiding? The deception from Joseph, that Jacob, he was no fool. He knew what was in their heart. He knew that they never liked Joseph anyway. Well, well yes, of course, Reuben, you would want to take him. He's the son of my right hand, ben my Benjamin. If something happens to Benjamin, Reuben, you'll be right back in line, won't you? Right there. To be the firstborn. He shall not go down with you. Huh. But in the, in, in the next chapter, Judah says, I'll look after him. Verse 38, and he said, my son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. The gray hairs, the trials, the stresses. Did you notice, brothers and sisters, one might be able to compartmentalize the life of Jacob into two separate camps, pardon the pun. His early years was that of physical, physical toil. We know that, an Assyrian ready to perish, physical toil. You changed my wages 10 times. I was out when slept, sleep went from me. I was out in the frost. Anything that died, you requited it at my hand. Those were dark days for Jacob. And as the years went by, there is another challenge that comes in his life. The challenge that possibly comes in the life of all brothers and sisters as the years roll by. It's more the mental stresses, isn't it? Oh yes, with all the modern gadgets of today, you know, Jesus, God says, by the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And in the workplace, there's stress. Who's giving me this stress? The stress is taken from the forehead, from the back, and just placed in a different place, right there. It's the stresses and strains that takes this man to a different spiritual height. <coughs> Chapter 43, verse 5. But if thou wilt not send him, Judah says, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. And Israel said, wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether ye had a yet a brother? So Judah says, father, if 
anything happens to Benjamin, I will bear it forever. And Jacob gives in. Verse 14. Verse 13, take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. He's worried for his sons. Sleepless nights, brothers and sisters. He's so concerned and rightly so. This man is acquainted with sorrows and with grief. This man, brothers and sisters, knew the hardships of trying to keep a family together with all its challenges and all the different personalities. And I'm talking about the ecclesia. And so, Judah, brothers and sisters, there it is, verse 3, chapter 43, verse 3. Ask yourself the question, ask those interrogatory pronouns, why in chapter 42, he says, you will not take him down. Reuben, now in verse 3, Judah spake, and he succumbs. And then he goes down in chapter 44, verse 18, then Judah came near. He came near and Judah pours out. He's, he's a changed man. And this is Judah's take and to see how inextricably linked Jacob is to Benjamin. And we said unto my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. And if ye take this also from me, our father said, and mischief before him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. Verse 34. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. <laughs> Judah encapsulates, brothers and sisters. How close, how close Jacob was to the son of his right hand. He encapsulates how close the Lord God Almighty is to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a thing. Chapter 45, that Joseph cries when he hears the outpouring of Judah. You, Judah, the one who sold me has come back into the fold. And they go back Verse 23, he reveals himself. Verse 24, look at the last words of Joseph to his brothers and see that ye fall not out in the way. He knew his brothers. He knew on the way back home that something might happen. What shall we tell father? Whose fault was it really? And see. My beloved brothers and sisters, that we fall not out in the way. That's echoes again of Abraham's herdsmen, Lot's herdsmen, isn't it? And Abraham rises above 
the schism and says, let there be no strife betwixt me and thee, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. For we be brethren. Let that, brethren and sisters, be always in our minds. For we be brethren in Christ. Verse 23, uh, verse uh, 25. And so it zooms back now to Jacob. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him saying, Joseph is yet alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted for he believed them not. This, this roller coaster of life, brothers and sisters. It's almost as if God is playing with our very innermost emotions. Why was that? Was that fair of God, we might ask? It's like that in our lives. It's not that God is playing with our emotions, brothers and sisters. Far from him. But God wants us to strive, to serve him, to love him, to trust him. To put our full confidence in him. You know, I went to a home of a brother and sister once. And in their lounge, on their mantelpiece, they had a sign. It said simply this. If we trust we won't worry. If we worry, we won't trust. For Jacob, he had come to unreservedly give everything to God, give it into God's hands that he alone knows best. <coughs> Whatever <coughs> happens in our lives, brothers and sisters, Verse 27, and they told him all the words of Joseph. Verse 28, and Joseph said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. No chapter division. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices. That's where it ends, brothers and sisters through the trials of life, and when God blesses us abundantly, we give thanks. Oh, no. And what saith the scripture? Giving thanks for all things. For all things, brothers and sisters. For all things. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I said in my earlier talk, 20 years, brothers and sisters, plus was Joseph away from the family, given up for dead. In fact, Jacob says that, that his brother is dead. Never once does God tell Jacob, that Joseph is alive and well in Egypt. Never once, brothers and sisters, that God wanted him to go through that time of trying and testing. To help, to guide, to nurture that response of thanksgiving. Verse 20, chapter 46. What a thing. Joseph makes ready his chariot, brothers and sisters. And in the distance, he sees his father. A frail old man. He makes ready his chariot. Verse 29. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck and wept a good while.
And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die. I've experienced so much. I've seen all that I need to see. Now let me die in peace. But there is one more thing that Jacob had to accomplish. In chapter 48, he brings, Joseph brings Ephraim and Manasseh, these two lads, only about knee-high, it says, they came from by his knees, only about knee-high, these two lads, Ephraim and Manasseh. And now, Joseph seeks the blessing. And he brings his two little lads in between this, this man. Chapter 47, firstly, please. He brings his father in. That's our title, verse, verse 5 of 47. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. And so he brings him in, this old man. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father. And sets him before the greatest ruler for thousands of miles. For remember, Joseph had not only been the provider of bread for his brethren, he had also been the provider of bread for the world, brothers and sisters. We could do a Bible school on that. And he brings him in, this frail man, and sets him before Pharaoh. And herein is a marvelous thing in like of Melchizedek. The greater blesses the lesser. Notice. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? <coughs> every gray hair, every line, every wrinkle, every furrow, brothers and sisters. The limp itself had a story to tell than this man. And, and, and Pharaoh could only look at this man. How old art thou? Have you noticed, brothers and sisters, when you're young, it's rude for people to ask you your age, but as you get older, you're quick to tell people, well, I'm in my 70s now, don't I look well? Have you noticed that? And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. And at the end of verse 10, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. He blesses him when he comes in and he blesses him when he goes out. Read carefully, brothers and sisters. And sandwiched between his life in a, in a verse is a cameo picture of Jacob's life itself. The blessings at Bethel. His life is sandwiched, brothers and sisters, between blessings. And finally, chapter 48. Joseph wants Jacob to bless his fathers. Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh being the eldest, Ephraim being the youngest. And Joseph brings them before and he lines up Manasseh with the right hand of Jacob. And Ephraim with the left hand of Jacob being the second born. And he lines them up and look what it says. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, who are these? And Joseph said unto him, his father, they are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, bring them, I pray thee, 
unto me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see. Just like Isaac. And he lines them up, brothers and sisters. Come near unto me. It is the smell of Esau, but the voice of Jacob. And he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God has shown me also thy seed. And Joseph took them, verse 13, both Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his right hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near unto him. And at the last moment, brothers and sisters, he switches his hands. He gives the younger the blessing. He guides his hands wittingly. And, and Joseph is very put out with that. Very put out. Verse 17. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, the younger, it displeased him. It was evil in his eyes. And he held his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head, the eldest. And Joseph said unto his father, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. What a thing, brothers and sisters, that in God's plan and purpose, it was so that Jacob had come to a realization that it was God who was guiding and directing all along. And then the chapter closes with a wonderful verse. Jacob dies. Well, it, it would end that way, wouldn't it? In a coffin in Egypt. Chapter 50, last verse of Genesis. In a coffin in Egypt. That's it, how it ends. Poise for what would come. My last reference, please, brothers and sisters. Come with me to Peter, the epistle of Peter. The second epistle of Peter and chapter three. We're told in Hosea chapter 12 that God found him in Bethel and spake with us. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner, that's our first talk, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the God. Brothers and sisters, we've been speaking about the kingdom of God, haven't we? And how it can't be far away with all the signs of the times. But actually... The kingdom for us, brothers and sisters, it's nearer than that. Because the kingdom for us is never ever only more than a lifetime away. And if we reach three score year and ten, and yet by reason of strength, for Abraham, brothers and sisters, his next waking moment after 4,000 years, will be the joy of the Lord. Looking for and hasting unto. Verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him. You see, brothers and sisters, we do the looking, but God finds us. God will find us as he found Jacob in Bethel.
in a hopeless, helpless state. I found him when he was so in need. Pray God that in that day, we will be found of him in peace, in the things of God, in the house of God, doing our Father's business. Amen.